Ok, vamos começar. A Maria Paula já saiu. Maria Paula já mandou. Então, vamos começar. Ok, todos chegaram ainda, mas aqui, como vocês sabem, é basicamente uma espécie de Suíça brasileira. O horário é o horário. Nós vamos começar na hora certa, tá? Bem-vindas, bem-vindos. Grande prazer tê-los aqui. Finalmente ao vivo, poder tocá-los, abraçar, beijar, essas coisas todas que nós fazemos e nem todos ainda chegaram aqui nesse lugar, mas estão chegando, se não por nós, pelo menos pelo Acarajé, não é? é? Não vou fazer nada muito demorado, a ideia é somente abrir, nós vamos ter agora a, a, a conferência de abertura, vai ser introduzida e conduzida aqui pelo Egrégio do Dr. Fabrino, e eu só queria dizer do meu extremo contentamento estar vocês todos aqui. Assim, tem o fato de que nós fomos separados por dois anos de pandemia, mas não é só pandemia que teve entre nós, aquele início nosso alegre, e, e esse momento agora teve muita coisa, né? passou um mar de tormentos e tormentas bem complicadíssimo. Esse NCT esteve para acabar em determinado momento, uma guerra com relação a fundos de pesquisa que não acabavam, não cessavam mais, a capa de bolsonarista que roubou nossas bolsas, né? depois o CNPq bolsonarista que devolveu as nossas bolsas, o CNPq astro, astronáutico, né? O CNPq astronáutico que devolveu as bolsas para a gente continuar e que prorrogou o nosso tempo. Então foi uma coisa complicadíssima, que está mais perto que viu o que foi esse tipo de coisa aqui. Só para dizer uma coisa para vocês, por um dia o CNPq, o, o NCT não fechou, né? Porque as bolsas acabavam num dia, no outro dia, no dia anterior, o astronauta deu umas bolsas que ajudou a continuar o que nós estamos fazendo. Quer dizer, o CNPq, o sistema de bolsas do NCT, né? Nós continuaríamos porque nós somos mais fortes do que o sistema, como disse Fernando Filgueiras, que aliás está fazendo aniversário nesse dia. Marcamos, marcamos esse CD para começar com o aniversário, com esse dia, com o aniversário de Fernando. Tá? Ok, então todos bem-vindos, eu espero que não vamos falar de problema nesse dia, não sei de problemas conceituais, vamos esquecer os problemas políticos, vamos beber muito, vamos comer muito, vamos discutir textos muito, é isso que afinal de contas é divertido na nossa parte, tá? É, política depois se verá tá certo? Segundo Camilo já era para estar tendo golpe então vamos aproveitar o intervalo que Camilo não está aqui não está tendo golpe e a gente vai fazer esse NCT o que vier depois se verá né? cada dia a sua própria agonia tá bom? Bem-vindo todos obrigado aos meninos que trabalharam muito para esse congresso, fofo acontecer e vocês vão ver como vai ser muito legal a gente se encontrar né, depois desse período todo, ok? Dito isso, passo a palavra ao chefe que vai conduzir os negócios. Eu vou sentar ali depois para começar para não ter toxicólogo para ouvir a moça aqui. Okay? Aproveite que chegou o caminho. Acontecer, vocês vão ver como vai ser muito legal a gente se encontrar né, depois desse período todo, ok? Dito isso, passo a palavra ao chefe que vai conduzir os negócios. Eu vou sentar ali depois para começar a aprender então, psicólogo para ouvir a nossa Foi um contato é, o, tempo, o tempo todo, mas em nome das várias pessoas envolvidas, Carreiro, João Sina, Samuel, Tatiana, todo mundo que esteve envolvido, participou da organização. A gente não conhece os bastidores, mas queria fazer esse agradecimento público. É, e vou, sem mais delongas, vou, vou passar para o inglês, fazer a apresentação da professora Nicole Curato, é, e na fato, é, o, tempo, o tempo todo, mas em nome das várias pessoas envolvidas, Carreiro, João Sina, Samuel, Tatiana, todo mundo que esteve envolvido, participou da organização, a gente não conhece os bastidores, mas queria fazer esse agradecimento público. É, e vou, sem mais delongas, vou, vou passar para o inglês, fazer a apresentação da professora Nicole Curato, é, e na sequência, então, está tá programado para vocês terem por volta de é, é, até sete e meia, então, ela vai fazer uma apresentação um pouco mais longa, mas a gente também tem espaço para perguntas, para questões, e aí fico aqui à disposição também para o que for necessário. Ok? So, Nicole, Nicole, se você puder, por favor, turn your camera on. So, let's. Ok. 
Okay, <laughs> so we, we switch to English now, uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, Nicole Curato. Nicole Curato is a professor of political sociology at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. Her research interests cover a wide range of topics, including democratic innovations, tragedies, political ethnography, populism, and democratic erosion. She is the author of Democracy in, time of, in a Time of Misery, From Spectacular Tragedy to Deliberative Action, published by Oxford uh, University Press in 2019, and one of the authors of Power and Deliberative Democracy, Norms, Forms, and Systems, published by Paul Grave in 2018, and of Deliberative Mini Public's Core Design Features, published by Bristol University Press in 2021. She is also the editor of the Journal of Deliberative Democracy and one of the editors of Research Methods in Deliberative Democracy, just published by Oxford University Press in open access format. <laughs> In addition to her academic achievements and in dialogue with them, she is a public intellectual with an active profile in multimedia public engagement. She has collaborated with the New York Times, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, the Australian Journal of Foreign Affairs, and CNN. She has hosted documentaries and produced podcasts for various outlets. And on a more personal note, I would like to add that she is probably one of the world's leading gene masters and owes a collection which is envied by the entire field of political science. We wish Nicole was here with us in Salvador, but it was impossible yes, this year. Yes, sir, but she promised and we yeah. hope that she can come in the future. But without well, further ado, let's hear. Uh, so, thank you to my dearest and so here we are relying on the relying on technology, digital technology um, to connect um, with to each connect other this each other evening, this evening, although I am, although I am confident very confident that we will see each other uh, in the flesh, uh, in the flesh um, sooner, um, than sooner than later. So let me so share, let me share um, um, my screen. My screen. Okay. Okay. Great. 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 So the title so of the my title of my talk is Bridging Parallel, parallel Years, Deliberative Responses to This Institution and Influential Operation of the Global South. South. This paper, this paper is, a is a spin off, off from our recently from our published, published, published report by the Harvard, Harvard Kennedy, Harvard Kennedy School, School Speech Center, Center for Media, Media, Politics, Media Politics, and Politics and Public Policy. And public policy. So, I so I would like to acknowledge all of my co authors, co -authors Jonathan, Jonathan Corp, 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 and the report and is the report based, is based on, collaborative on collaborative studies, collaborative studies on influence influence operations, operations, presidential, presidential midterm elections, midterm elections in the Philippines. Research was funded by international, international, international media, media, media support, non support and non-profit. So, so and probably, so probably from from my, uh, 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 I was born, uh, born and raised in, 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 in the Philippines. I left, I left, I left 20, years, 20 ago. years ago. Now, now is now a revelation. Um, um, I, I left, I, I left home, I left home and finished university, 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 found the conservatism, rather and rather and rather and The Philippines, the Philippines, for example, is the only country in the world without divorce, except for the Vatican. It was only ten years ago when the when the law was the law was was required the government to distribute the funds as a matter of holding and holding and holding and holding and holding and holding and today and it's today not it's not uncommon for people, people to see me a 40 year old, old child or child or less goblin as a total failure and so I know my story is not because I know because I know the commonality and so what I'm going to do this evening is to tell you the story of the story uh, in, relation, uh, in relation, in relation, uh, in relation, in relation, and its legacy, and its legacy, its legacy, legacy in its parallel, public parallel, parallel, public 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 parallel,
now for us now to decide about how we can about how we can share share reality, 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 reality by going beyond the going frame, beyond frame, beyond frame, not judgment, frame, not judgment, not judgment of Western liberal democratic, Western Western democratic thought, thought about the public about the public spheres unfolding unfolding emerging emerging or being formed in the global global so let's begin so let's so let's begin. In 2008, 2008, 2008, Katie Harbaugh, public policy director for global, global elections, named the Philippines, named the Philippines as, the as the patient zero, zero in the global, in the global disinformation, disinformation epidemic. For her, for her, for her Philippine, Philippine President, President, President Rodrigo, Rodrigo Duterte's electoral victory was, was, like, was and like, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. A month later, a month later, it was Brexit, and then Trump, and then Trump nomination, and then you had the U.S. elections. elections. Of course, what she was referring to was the rights of social media manipulation, manipulation, manipulation to win elections win associated, associated, associated to the Cambridge, to the Cambridge Analytics scandal. scandal. And we know and the we story, know right? story right? Facebook, Facebook data, 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 Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, Analytica whistleblower, whistleblower, whistleblower Wiley, Christopher Wiley, Wiley described the Philippines as a Petri dish. dish. The country has, the country a, high, has, has a high usage of with very little, with very regulation, little regulation, which allows the which so-called, allows so-called, so-called, so-called bad actors to test out media manipulation strategies before implementing these manipulation strategies in Western liberal democracies. So as Wiley puts it, you can experiment on tactics and you wouldn't be able to see or, or test or the test West. in the West. And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, it doesn't you won't matter. get caught. You won't get and caught. if it does work, it does then work, you can figure then out can figure out, out or how to other country, other countries. So in a way, so in, in a way, these portrayals, portrayals of those like countries, countries, like countries, like the Philippines, as a laboratory, as a laboratory for disinformation, disinformation where where Western Western um, disinformation um, specialists experiment on tactics of disinformation in the global south and use these techniques in the west if it works in the global south and of course making things more interesting is a position of the philippines in the global wave of populism because before brexit before trump before bolsonaro the philippines one of asia's oldest democracies elected a man whose campaign promise was to literally kill all drug addicts. And this is a president who delivered on this promise, such that today the International Criminal Court is investigating whether the police killings of suspected drug addicts have reached genocidal proportions. But the drama in the Philippines does not end there. And to a certain extent, maybe I'm very envious of Brazil because at least now you have a different pathway to chart the course of your democracy. At least you have a different story that you can tell now. Because in the Philippines, the story remains the same. In May, the Philippines headed to the polls and winning by a landslide is Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the son and namesake of the late dictator who was ousted from a power uh, from a peaceful revolution in 1986, the picture you see on the screen. The dictatorship was the Philippines' darkest period. 50,000 people had been detained, including human rights workers, journalists, church workers, student activists, and the political opposition. Many were tortured. Comparisons were made with Argentina's dirty war, where many opposition leaders, activists, and journalists disappeared in the middle of the night, and the desaparecidos were never found. The Philippines sank into poverty during this period. The picture you see on the left is a picture of a nine-year-old girl who died a few days after the photo was taken because of malnutrition due to famine. While the picture you see on the right is the picture of the First Lady Imelda Marcos, And as we know, the Marcoses are among the most notorious in plundering the nation's wealth, such that banks in Switzerland, notorious for money laundering, were pressured to return the wealth the Marcoses stole to the Philippine government after the Marcoses were removed from power. So as I mentioned, the picture you see on the right are pictures of Imelda Marcos and her notorious obsession with shoes, jewelry, and property, and New York. But it's 2022, 
and the Philippines voted Ferdinand Marcos Jr. back in power. This guy is now this guy. <laughs> and it's not just him. His son won a seat in Congress. His cousin is now the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And his sister is a senator of the Republic of the Philippines. And the puzzle is how did they do it? How did a family ousted by a peaceful revolution in 1986 get their act together and manage to return a successful comeback in one of the most vibrant democracies in Asia? Many studies point to their systematic disinformation on social media. A Cambridge Analytica whistleblower claimed that the Marcos family hired them to do a family rebranding. Over the years, many conspiracy theories emerged on YouTube that puts into question the real reason why people power happened. Apparently, the CIA had something to do with it, that the Marcos regime, according to this story, was the golden age of the Philippines. Bridges were built, Singapore looked to the Philippines for inspiration, that the country was the envy of the world. Other videos on YouTube show stashes of gold um, were stored, and when Marcoses return to power, they will redistribute the gold to the nation once they become president. So that is the picture you see on the left side of your screen, that apparently there are 400,000 metric tons of gold that the family will redistribute to the country once they um, return to power. Um, others are more benign. The Washington Post, the picture you see on the right, for example, uncovered a network of TikTok influencers that created a celebrity of the Marcos children, portraying them as heartthrob celebrities in their own right. And it seems benign, but these are used to soften the Marcos name that was once associated to torture, corruption, and brutality. So this is the situation. We now have a parallel public sphere in the Philippines where people like me who insist on not forgetting the brutality of the dictatorship cannot have a conversation with people who are persuaded that the dictatorship was actually the golden age of the Philippines, that the dictator's son is bringing us back to that golden age. And I know this is very triggering to some people in the audience because I know similar stories have unfolded in Brazil as well, justifying torture, justifying dictatorship, as if these are morally acceptable um, um, moments in our political history. And the dominant narrative of this information in the Philippines is one where bad actors like Cambridge Analytica the illiberal regime of Rodrigo Duterte, the power and money of the Marcoses, and some other forms of technological alchemy manipulated our digital public sphere, which corrodes democracy. And I argue that this is the same narrative that we hear from Western liberal democracies, that there are bad actors and we need to hold bad actors accountable. This is the dominant narrative we hear from journalists, activists, donors, tech platforms, and aid agencies. This is the dominant narrative that leads to initiatives like fact-checking projects, media literacy programs, in, in the case of Facebook, putting together a Facebook oversight board, the so-called Supreme Court of Facebook, to decide on controversial cases. And so I think today, the dominant narratives that I mentioned have shaped how we understand disinformation and how we design corresponding action to fight disinformation. But my colleagues and I are not persuaded that this is the narrative that we should believe when we talk about disinformation. Uh, we are not persuaded, and we have three reasons. First, we think it, it is our responsibility as academics to question unreliable narrators when it comes to telling stories about disinformation. Of course, there is a market incentive for commercial actors to overstate the impact of Cambridge Analytica because it allows them to sell the same services. My colleague here in Australia, Ross Tapsell, observed this in Malaysia, where a company came up to then-President Najib 
said they were able to win an election in one country because of their media manipulation strategies. And they can do the same thing in Malaysia. And they do it. They overstate their claims because this is their way of selling their service. And this is the same story for whistleblowers. Chris Wiley's redemption story in Cambridge Analytica being a whistleblower is tied to a six-figure book deal, among other things, where you know he, he makes it appear like, yeah, it's good to be a whistleblower. It's good to, to speak up. But it's also important to maintain a, a critical perspective when we listen to narratives that overstate the role of disinformation in winning elections. Second, I think it's unhelpful to use a Western liberal democratic lens to interpret practices of disinformation in the global South. The narrative I mentioned to you, I think is too homogenizing. It portrays the global South as a recipient of disinformation tactics devised in the West. We are called a Petri dish, patient zero, a laboratory, as if there are no creative dynamics of disinformation taking place in the global South. We very much argue that actually the global South are not just victims or laboratories of disinformation tactics created by the North. Global South actors are very much creative agents of creating disinformation tactics that suit the local context. And finally, I think these narratives of disinformation displace the voices of ordinary citizens. Citizens in these narratives are portrayed as unknowing victims of manipulation, rather than political agents who have their own views about the information landscape that they co-construct themselves. And so we think it is time to build on the growing field of critical disinformation studies. And so in the remainder of my presentation, I draw on our empirical work and recast these critiques into three arguments that hopefully advance critical disinformation studies. The first argument we'd like to make is to make a case for the critical political economy of disinformation. We argue that instead of putting a spotlight on the so-called bad actors that orchestrate disinformation from boardrooms among tech executives and political campaigners, we place the spotlight on the oversupply of highly skilled and underpaid labor who are vulnerable to being tapped as agents of disinformation. What do I mean by this? Well, the Philippines is one of the global hubs of the call center industry. And the same is true for countries like India. There is a generation of subcontracted tech savvy millennials who have developed a skill set of code switching turning on an American accent when answering phones for Ameri American call centers, putting on an Australian accent to provide tech support to Australian clients. So here in Australia, when I call the phone um, to report that my internet is not working, most likely someone from the Philippines will pick up that call, put up an Australian accent, ask me how the weather, what the weather is like, how I'm feeling about spring, and pretend to be in Australia but very much um, happening, uh, taking the call uh, from, from the Philippines. And this oversupply of underpaid and highly skilled workers is exactly the political economy of disinformation. Because how else can this skill set be monetized by precarious digital workers? So we find that by working as fake account operators, digital precarious digital workers can actually augment their income. These workers use the same skills they use in call centers, just like in call centers where they have to assume different identities for their call center jobs. They're used to the vernaculars of pop culture and expressions that establish emotional resonances with their audience. There is a commercial incentive to be rude uh, when they play the role of, of fake account operators because the more retweets, the higher the pay. So these account operators find no moral dilemma in their work because politicians are just like other clients, like brands that hired them to make tweets or posts um, go viral. So the point that we're making here is that we cannot understand disinformation in the global south without understanding the political economy of precarious digital workers who are trying to augment their income 
by serving as fake account operators. But that's also not the full story. My colleagues, Jonathan Corpus Ong and Jason Cabanas uncovered in their report that we also need to hold fake account operators as chief disinformation architects. I'm not sure what it's like in Brazil, but in the Philippines, they found that high-powered executives working in respectable advertising agencies, launching campaigns for household brands like shampoos and dishwashing liquid, are also maintaining the accounts of politicians that perpetuate fake news and disinformation. And these high-powered executives conceptualize disinformation campaigns, but they rely on the precarious digital workers to do the dirty work of crafting memes and slogans that make the internet toxic. So the main argument is when we talk about disinformation, shouldn't we start shifting the blame and accountability to these high powered executives who earn big money by running influence operations? We also argue that disinformation tactics are not homogenous. Countries like the Philippines are not just a laboratory of disinformation for foreign actors. Our empirical work during elections demonstrates the creative agency among local disinformation actors that make disinformation harder to detect. So what you see on your screen here is an example that we got three years ago of an Instagram influencer who usually posts uh, shirtless selfies He's a thirst trap influencer, very hot, posts gym selfies, posts travel selfies, and then suddenly posts a picture of a man running for the Senate interspersed with his selfies that are very social in orientation. These are not monitored by campaign finance. These are not monitored um, by, by election, um, by the Electoral Commission. But interspersed with these Instagram posts are endorsements of politicians that are harder to detect. So it, we, we consider this to be part of an influence um, operation. Another example that we spotted recently are influence operations that are more benign, that legitimize the dictatorship. So here on the left side of your screen, you see a picture of one of the most famous vloggers in the Philippines who invited the president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., to do a house tour of the Malacanang Palace, the presidential palace. And in this house tour, they tried to portray the president as a benign actor. They asked him his stories when he was a young boy growing up in the presidential palace, as if that period was unproblematic as if that period was a period of time when torture did not happen, when corruption did not happen. This is a very interesting example. The vlogger asked the president, where was the closet full of shoes by the first lady, Imelda Marcos? Asking the question innocently. The president said, oh, oh, they're not here. The shoes that you mentioned, they, they were just for display. Those weren't her shoes. The vlogger asked, the 3,000 pairs of shoes. The president said, those were not her shoes. He was saying those were not his mother's shoes. They were actually presents. They were presents by sh local shoe manufacturers who wanted them, who wanted their shoes to be displayed by the first lady because she was so popular. And the vlogger said, ah, that's why the shoes had different sizes. So as the vlogger oohed and awed throughout the tour, she signaled to her subscribers that they together are uncovering stories buried by journalists, historians, and politicians who have an ax to grind against the Marcos family after, the, after democracy was restored in 1986. The claims about the shoes are devious claims, casually dropped in conversation, that Imelda Marcos did not, earn, did not own 3,000 pairs of shoes which served, served to undermine the corruption and frivolity that marked the dictatorship. That the vlog featured a house tour, a form of digital content associated with influencers, giving their subscribers a direct and authentic access to everyday lives, portrays the Marcoses as a hospitable family who are kind enough to invite people to their homes as guests, 
because they have nothing to hide. And this is very much part of the influence operation to whitewash history, to contest historical facts represented by the frivolity of the first lady who owned 3,000 pairs of shoes, of the family who siphoned money from the country as fake news. On social media in the Philippines today, it is now settled. The Marcuses were not a corrupt family, that the Marcuses were the rightful occupants of the presidential palace, that the nation actually owes them an apology, respect and reparation after years of humiliation by their political opponents, that everything in 1986 that ousted them from power was a conspiracy theory. This is, much, this is very much part of cultural production in the Philippines. And this is a warning to the world that historical facts are never settled, that influence operations that are subtle and creative can turn history and change history in the most creative of ways. It's very depressing. I need to take a moment and get a little drink because this to me is, is, very, is very depressing. But, there is a happier story behind this. Because the final point I wish to make is that beyond these narratives, manipulation actually is a way out. Final argument I, I wish to make is that we have to also be critical of mainstream narratives of disinformation, like the one I mentioned just now, because it also tends to displace the voices of ordinary citizens. I think citizens are often portrayed as naive and manipulable, as a subject of media, of media literacy programs, as if ordinary citizens have no ideas of their own about this information. And I think the problem with the way we construct ordinary citizens is that we don't trust that citizens have political agency, that when we give them time to reflect and examine pieces of disinformation, they actually see through it. And in fact, they can actually detect wider problems of this information. So what did we do? Our team conducted a three-day deliberative forum on disinformation over Zoom. We invited 26 randomly selected Filipinos from all over the country to come together to learn about, the, about this information. They represented a variety of ages, gender, geographical location, and socioeconomic status. We asked them to deliberate on the dangers created by the spread of fake news, and we asked them questions on who should be held accountable for the production of disinformation and who should safeguard social media from the harms of disinformation. We asked them to generate collective recommendations for stakeholders leading campaigns against disinformation. Um, our deliberative forum, unlike focus group discussions, allow participants to learn about the issues. So the picture you see on the screen is my collaborator, Jonathan Corpus Long, who first introduced himself by talking about his skincare regimen and the use of crystal face rollers before giving an overview of the literature um, of what is the information, what it means, how it's different for misinformation, what are the regulatory debates happening in the Philippines, et cetera. Um, we also invited experts, including the head of Facebook's public policy group in the Philippines, a representative of fact-checking organizations, volunteer lawyers, and electoral integrity lawyers, um, who were able to give um, the participants more information about the lay of the land when it comes to disinformation. And so we asked participants, based on that information, to identify institutions and personalities they consider responsible for the spread of this information. And their responses, I think, are really inspiring. First, participants said that disinformation is not the problem itself. This information is actually part of a wider problem of money politics. They say that politicians enhance their image by paying people to slander their critics through disinformation tactics. 
One participant said, fake news is just like vote buying. Vote buying pays for votes. Fake news pays for voice. It's a familiar practice. They're all familiar with it. It's a practice that predates social media. So the moral panic that takes place among journalists, among academics, uh, among aid agencies, from the perspective of ordinary citizens is actually not new. They're very used to being lied to during elections. And for them, the problem is not disinformation. The problem is with the role of money in politics. We can solve disinformation as a problem, but that doesn't solve necessarily the role of money in politics. Secondly, participants recognize that disinformation thrives because of economic insecurity. They say that those who are trafficking in disinformation include both journalists who are struggling to make ends meet and ordinary citizens seeking creative ways to make money. So they are cognizant of the political economy of disinformation. And finally, they say that beyond disinformation, the bigger problem for them is the unfettered media power. They find um, this finding actually connects with broader trends of the public's declined trust in mainstream media, especially its independence from economic and political interests. So while many participants primarily source their information from mainstream media organizations like television, they expressed concern over the media's capacity um, to publish or broadcast incorrect news or biased news with impunity. So participants said they're actually more concerned with misleading headlines, media spin, and unfair treatment of political personalities and smearing of innocent people. So participants actually said, yes, they are concerned with disinformation, but they have also long been concerned with media bias. And fourth, participants also recognize that, of course, they too have individual responsibility in the spread of disinformation. So after characterizing the problem of disinformation in the Philippines, we asked them to generate recommendations on how social media can be protected from disinformation during elections. Participants near reached a near consensus on the following recommendations. They said, yes, we may actually need an anti-fake news, uh, anti news and anti-trolling law, but with caveats. Participants said that learning from the lessons of Malaysia and Singapore, there must be safeguards against abusing this law to silence political opposition and the state's critics and ordinary citizens. Second, they also said that the law should have appropriate funding, because what is the use of fake news laws if investigation agencies are not um, are not sufficiently supported to support um, to to address cyber crime, and they are also very much worried that we may have strong laws against this, against this information, but there may be unequal implementation of the law in the Philippines. These might just be used to penalize the poor and excuse the rich, and therefore they were very clear in stating their caveats. The second recommendation is. Shouldn't the bigger issue be political dynasties? Shouldn't the discussion of disinformation not be linked to a wider discussion about creating an anti-political dynasty law? Since participants view disinformation as part of the wider issue of money politics, they recognize that meaningful electoral reform can only unfold when the concentration of political power to a few families is dismantled. In the Philippines, 70, 70, 70% 70 of the Congress is run by people who inherited their position from a family member. So in other words, 70% of Congress is run by a mother and son tandem, by a father-daughter tandem, or a congressman being um, limited, by, uh, limited to run from office because of term extension. That congressman is just replaced by his wife or by his son um, to, to take over power. 70% of the Congress is just like that. So a lot of Filipinos see that the bigger problem is not disinformation. The bigger problem is concentration of political power to a few families. And the final recommendation is obviously to strengthen educational campaigns and to um, extend media literacy programs um, to, 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 to different geographical um, locations. So where does this take us? I end with two points. 
First, I hope this presentation made a case for critical disinformation studies. We argued for the centering of narratives away from homogenizing storylines defined by Western liberal democratic standpoint, and instead portray the global South not as a petri dish or patient zero, but an active participant in the disinformation ecosystem, which has its own histories, political economy, and cultural contexts. Second, I hope that through the deliberative forum, I was able to demonstrate the complexity of how ordinary citizens understand this information. When we interviewed participants before the deliberative forum, we observed their views on disinformation were individualistic. Usually they said, yeah, the problem with disinformation is you have to think before you share, you need to learn how to fact check, you need to verify that the accounts you follow are not bot accounts. But after this information, after participants critically engaged with expert evidence and after they brainstormed together, we, we observed a shift to a structural and critical account of disinformation where they place responsibility not on a few bad actors, but to a systematic flaw in the system that is built around money and power. That ordinary citizens actually have a very rich account of disinformation. They actually have a rich structural and systematic account of disinformation. So I think the view that ordinary citizens are passive, naive, and manipulable actors, I hope that is put to rest. In conclusion, I would like to go back to where I started in this speech, that I left my home country because I found the conservatism unbearable. But after this research, I'm reminded that there is more that connects us than divides us. The polarization, whether on the level of politics or on the level of values, is constructed. That there are actually people who stand to gain from inflaming hatred and sowing division. The deliberative forum to me is a reminder that when people are given the right conditions to reflect and connect with each other, we are capable of exposing power and thinking of ways to confront it. And of course, the question is, how can the public sphere be like this more often? So thank you for listening. I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Nicole. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, so thank you for your presentation. And now we're open for Q&A. So uh, I'll just speak in Portuguese quickly. Se alguém quiser fazer pergunta e precisar de apoio na tradução, fico à vontade. Mas também podem ficar à vontade para fazer questões em inglês diretamente para a Nicole. Então fique em... E eu registro as inscrições e passo para vocês aí. Só pediria que vocês falassem nesse microfone aqui. So, first question. The first one is the hardest one. So. <laughs> Hi, Nicole, can you hear me? Hi, this is Andresa, Andresa, and I actually I'm from Singapore and I'm at it, so I'm familiarized with Jonathan's work and also Ross Tapsell that you mentioned. And one of the things that you that you site is the connection in critical disinformation studies in the global south but yes that is actually the challenges that i see yes that by being very, Brazil it's a very hard is so this connection our you know, in our latest report talk about the global south uh, how to connect uh, the regions with Jonathan or similar countries in a way that are one of the uh, action points we actually uh, recommend to funders and um 
global civil society organizations is to focus on south to south initiatives and we say this because we feel that a lot of the initiatives um, by funders and donor agencies are still very much using the frames of the west so for example fact checking initiatives or um, even the logics of competitive funding it's like there's this big grant um, against disinformation um, and civil society groups in the global south are made to compete each other for these grants and so the result of that are very fragmented strategies of disinformation among civil society organizations right the logics of these groups are very much there's a lot of turf wars, there's a lot of um, trying to, to persuade donors that their project is innovative and different from other civil society organizations, that's why they should receive the funding. And Global South countries are made to compete with each other um, with these funding opportunities. So one of our recommendations is that maybe some of these um, global pots of funding to fight this information can first promote South to South collaboration and creating more uh, sorry, collaborative grant applications, for example, Philippines, Brazil, India, uh, Malaysia, to work together and come up with a shared language of how this information emerges from these countries and propose interventions that are grounded on the lived experiences of people from the ground, rather than using a bigger frame that is imposed by these funding agencies that are usually coming um, from the global north. So I think that is one um, practical way of advancing um, these conversations. On the level, I think, of scholarship, and I think this is also starting to emerge already, there is a lot of initiatives in this front, um, doing more comparative cases with South to South exchanges. In Southeast Asia, so far, the comparative work has been on the level of policy, comparing anti-fake news legislation or attempts to legislate fake new, uh, anti-fake news laws in the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, Southeast Asia having this reputation as a laboratory of authoritarian innovations. Um, so there is, there is that. So I suppose this is also my invitation um, to the group to share um, ongoing work uh, in the region um, the thing on, um, to see how these comparative um, cases are also happening um, either in in Latin America or also comparisons um, uh, uh, more more globally, especially in very tech savvy, um, very tech savvy um, global south, um, not necessarily countries, but but cities, um, especially sites of um, the global production of digital labor. So thank you for that question. Actually, have one question. And then, uh, in in the recommendations, you mentioned one of the possibilities as uh, more educational campaigns, and I I'm not sure if the the idea of educational campaigns in itself is an in contrast with the idea that the publics can be manipulated. Uh, I tend to see uh, fake news sometimes as um, part of the repertoire of contention, and. Uh, do you believe that people share fake news because they are manipulated and because they're not sure that, that because they don't know that they are sharing something that is fake, or is it often often the case that they share because they don't care if something is fake or not, because the the political stakes yeah. are so high that One it's worth sharing something that we're not entirely sure if it's fake or not, or even if it, uh, it's. I have heard this warning that it's also important not to romanticize. Um, in this case, if the subjects or research subjects are ordinary people, it's also important not to romanticize people who share fake news as if it's also just part of the repertoire of contention. There is big money with fake news operations, and that's what we uncovered in the Philippines. The return of the Marcoses from being ousted in 1986 to coming back to the presidency in 1986 on the 50th anniversary since the dictatorship was declared did not happen organically, right? This is bankrolled by a lot of resources and it's systematic. So that's one part of the story. Um, blame and accountability should be placed 
on the chief architects of disinformation, people who stand to gain political power and people who stand to make a profit from perpetuating disinformation. So to a certain extent, we need to emphasize that. But on the other hand, I agree with you that yes, ordinary citizens are agentic actors who sometimes are aware that sharing fake news is a way of, for example, expressing discontent with liberal democracy in the Philippines. And that's very much part of it. Um, exposing, even, it's, even though it's fake news, some of these fake news items expose the, um, what is the term? The, the callousness of liberal democratic politicians um, because they don't care about the poor, right? And this is why populist leaders like Rodrigo Duterte became so popular because um, the fake news that they spread have resonances that, yeah, liberal elites don't care about us, whereas populist leaders care about us. So yeah, that's being shared. So I do understand that. Um, but I think that the point, at least in our deliberative forum, the point of the educational campaigns was for people to at least have a fair shot at knowing how to determine fake news from real news. There is a genuine, um, there is a genuine de desire to learn, but Actually, I should have mentioned this earlier. Part of the recommendation for educational campaigns as well is to empower local journalists, empower local news as well. Because again, and I think this is such this is such a beautiful recommendation because ordinary citizens also recognize that the reason why there is fake news, especially on the local level, is because local news organizations are being defunded, right? National news media tend to share a fake photo that is, for example, if there's a disaster, there's a photo taken by a random person shared on Twitter, and then national media amplifies that picture taken as truth, whereas in reality, that picture was really taken from somewhere else, not the disaster site. What is the issue there? The issue there is because you don't have local journalists who can actually produce credible content, who can actually take pictures from credible sources. So part of the education that they're asking for is to rebuild the ethos of local journalism and to rebuild, to channel efforts at educational campaigns back to rebuilding cultures of um, news gathering and reporting uh, on the local level. So I think that's also quite powerful. And I think in one forum that we had with funding agencies, so similar, similar format, um, deliberative forum with recommendations addressed to funding agencies, the recommendation was why don't you just fund local media? Why are we so bothered with disinformation, whereas we know that disinformation thrives because local media is so underfunded? But I don't know why that recommendation did not appeal. Maybe because we're still using the frame of disinformation, right? We're still going for this sexy topic instead of funding local, local journalists. So yeah, that's, that's my take on it. I, I can't hear anymore. Yes. Okay, uh, we have one more question still. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Arodo. I come from South Brazil, and I'm loving to be here in Northeast, and especially in Bahia now, for already three months. And yes, now, yeah. here and it was interesting because I don't use internet or Instagram that much but they were telling me about my state in South Brazil that it was a case of Nazism mm -hmm. and it spread so quickly that people used to believe that we on the south or especially on my state we were uh, pro-Nazi uh, 
And how to find those so so bad informations? Because they took some videos from people doing the the respect of the flag from the country, and that is totally normal in in many situations of democracy, right? And they took it wow, so quickly that, and they make it incredible. so badly I'm so sorry that, over that Bahia that people are so, so friendly. In our work, and that's my question, how to um, even to fight so ugly situations of, but to actually of that, please. <laughs> Okay, is this better? Let's try. So the, uh, the recommendation we used in our report is to always track architects of disinformation. It's easy to obviously worry about people who believe in perpetual disinformation on the ground, but when these forms of fake news are happening, there is a there are people who have economic So I'm not sure how to operate in the Philippine context. A lot of people try to expose people who stand politically and economically from that kind of, of false information. Um, so we don't necessarily name and shame people on the ground who believe in that, but we try to expose people who are the chief. Uh, do again. Do uh, anyone have another question? Okay. Sorry, Yannick. Also, let's. Do, do we have any other questions? So, Nicole, I think that's. Uh, I, I would like to thank you again for your presentation, for your talk. It's a pity you couldn't be here in Brazil with us, and uh, I do hope that you'll come to Brazil another time. And uh, we look forward to, to, to reading.